please rise for the call to worship. You're already up. Tr Trust in the Lord and do good. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. God is our refuge and strength. Please be seated. And as you are seated, join me in the opening prayer. We believe, O oh Lord, that you have abandoned us to the dim light of our own reason to conduct us to happiness but that you have revealed in holy scriptures whatever is necessary for us to believe and practice. How noble and excellent are the precepts. How sublime and enlightening the truth. How persuasive and strong the motives. How powerful the assistance of your holy religion. Our delight shall be in your statutes and we will not forget your word. Amen. Today's scripture reading is from Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 to 16. There may be some differences in the program. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under the bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Well, this morning I would like to begin a four-part sermon series on the moral teachings of Jesus. I want to do this because... Many people in the world and many people who do not identify themselves as Christians still believe that Jesus of Nazareth is one of the most, one of the greatest moral teachers that the world has ever known. And I believe as a church we should celebrate that I also want to preach this sermon series because I think sometimes within the church we have downplayed the moral teachings of Jesus in favor of talking more about personal salvation, how Jesus is our Savior. And it always strikes me as rather odd that if the only spiritual question we have is, how will I get to heaven after I'm dead, that we really have done a disservice to all of the teachings that Jesus offers. Now, I don't mean to belittle that concern. I very much would like to go to heaven at the end of my life. And I trust and I believe in God's power to bring that blessing. But Jesus said a whole lot more than that. To grasp the moral teachings of Jesus, we need to begin where Jesus began. The basic presumption that Jesus holds behind everything that he taught is the belief that God made the world and that God longs for the world to reach a glorious fulfillment. It's the basic truth that Jesus teaches. 
And the second step of the great moral teaching of Jesus is that since God is leading us forward to this destiny, faith means imagining that future and living today as if that future were completely realized. And if we hold on to those two sentences, that can be a useful framework to understand all that is within the New Testament. Now the means by which Jesus teaches is also fairly simple. Since the overarching idea is not that complicated, it's not a series of explanation and explanation. Jesus does not write a complex manifesto explaining all things. Rather, Jesus uses short, pithy proverbs, clear stories, and very decisive actions, all of which are meant to jar at our imaginations, to, to wake us up, to move us out of the world of our own presumptions, and to see the world as God sees the world. And once we see things through God's eyes, then we are converted, then we are made whole. And so my hope and my prayer in preaching these sermons is that our imaginations would be activated by seeing things differently, that our lives would be inspired, and that we would walk away from a human perspective and walk toward a divine perspective. So over the next four weeks, I will talk about the moral teachings of Jesus from that very simple framework. Today, I will talk about Jesus' teachings about a universal God. Next Sunday, I'll talk about our human impulse toward retaliation, and then the Sunday after that, the golden rule, and then finally, what Jesus teaches about judgment. Now, when I use the phrase, a universal God, I mean something very, very specific. I mean that there is only one God. And that that one God has created all human beings. It seems like a rather simple proposition, does it not? And Jesus was not the first person to teach it. He most likely learned it from his Jewish roots. Primitive religious understandings did not believe in one God. Primitive religious traditions tended to be rather tribal. That a small group of people, perhaps living in an isolated village, believed that they were descendant from their God and that the neighboring tribes that worshiped another god were descendants of that other god. Their god watched over them. Their god protected them. Their god gave them food. It was a useful belief because 
the other tribe was not human. The other tribe was not fully a human being. Therefore, if you had to take their food so you could eat, if you had to drive them from their land because yours has not been cared for, if you had to go to war with them and take their lives, you were not killing a creation of your God. You know, we can still see vestiges of that idea in some parts of the Hebrew Bible. I like the fifth chapter of 1 Samuel. You see this fairly clearly. Israel is doing battle with the dreaded Philistines. And in one particular battle, it goes quite poorly for them. They are routed and the Ark of the Covenant is captured by the Philistines. And the Philistines take the Ark of the Covenant and they bring it back to their village. And of course, they put it in the house of Dagon. Dagon is their God. And they neatly tuck the God away. You know, you put like things together, right? <laughs> so they neatly tuck the Ark of the Covenant in the house of Dagon and go about their business. The next morning, they open the door and lo and behold, Dagon has fallen from the perch of honor and there is Dagon face down on the ground before the Ark of the Covenant. Well, not too terribly vexed, the Philistines pick their God up and dust the dirt off the face and replace Dagon back to his perch of honor and go about their business until the next morning. They go into Dagon's house and there is Dagon again in the exact same spot, face down on the ground before the Ark of the Covenant, only this time. The arms are broken off the statue and the statue is decapitated. Well, this creates quite a stir and the Philistines are in quite disarray. They take the Ark of the Covenant out of Dagon's house and they send it off to uh, a city that I guess they're not too fond of that city. And they send the Ark of the Covenant there and all the people in that city rise up in revolt and the Philistines have absolutely no choice but to return the Ark of the Covenant to Israel. So they put it in a cart and, and, and just to make sure everything's okay, they fill the cart with gold and they send the cart back to Israel saying, you can keep the cows as well. <laughs> can we not see? the vestige of tribalism, the vestige of a kind of hubris which says, my God's better than your God, na 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 na. <clears throat> that is not a universal God. That is not the God we know in all of scripture. A universal God requires a universal people. A universal God does not participate in our human hostilities, but calls us all to rise above them. Maybe you'd think of the story of Abraham in the Oaks of Mamir. Abraham is living in a tent. He got the promise from God long ago that he and Sarah would have a child and, and 
Yet that promise had not been fulfilled. And one day while Abraham is by the tent, three, st three strangers approach. They are not from Abraham's tribe, but he greets them warmly, extending hospitality to another tribe, offering food, bread, and wine, washing their feet. And in the gentle conversation, these strangers remind Abraham of the promise of a universal God. They say, Sarah will conceive. Sarah will bear a son. Of course, Sarah overhears it and she laughs. She's well into her hundreds by now, and she thinks the whole idea of having a child is probably humorous. And she laughs. And they hear her laugh. And there really is a connection between this story and the birth of Isaac because the name Isaac means son of laughter. A universal God calls for a universal people who live together within a peaceable kingdom. Or at least that's what Diana Butler Bass argues. We are to share laughter and promise, not warfare and mayhem. Hospitality replaces hostility. And then right after this wonderful event, the very same strangers travel. They travel to the city of Sodom. And there they experience hospitality from, Lot's nep from Abraham's nephew, Lot. But the members of Lot's tribe start banging on the doors. They want to abuse these members of the foreign tribe because, well, maybe they're not human. Maybe they don't count. And to Lot's credit, he locks the door. The universal God can call us into conflict with our own tribe when we know in our heart and in our soul that our kinsmen have cruel intent and evil design. These are the stories that would have flowed so freely in the mind of Jesus of Nazareth. That when he looked out at that people on the side of the mountain and he said, you are the salt of the earth. Don't you dare lose your saltiness. You are the light of the world, shine. He's trying to, 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 to awaken the imagination inside each and every hearer that we would live in a world not just of our tribe, but of the whole human family. A city built on a hill cannot be hidden and we cannot build a city on the hill of a universal God without knowing that the light is not just for us but it is for all. My heart leaps for joy whenever I hear members of the Islamic community condemning the radicalized acts 
of some of those terrorists, doesn't yours? And my heart breaks. My heart breaks whenever I hear Christians vilifying all Muslims because of the shameful behavior of a few. Does yours? I uh, came across an interesting uh, series of reflections not too long ago about this belief in a universal God. And Brian McLaren was thinking out loud about the history of spirituality and thinking particularly about our Muslim neighbors. And he wonders if maybe it's not possible that through the long years of history, the residents of the uh, Arabian Peninsula came to believe in a universal God, one God who creates all people and who loves all people. But they might have been reluctant to embrace Judaism because there were centuries of warfare between the Arab peoples and their Jewish neighbors. Brian McLaren continues to wonder if the same might be true of the relationship between Christians and the peoples of the Arabian Peninsula. Because there had been many, many years of people who were Christian in name only, treating that population with cruelty. An interesting thought, and I hope you'll let that work in your imagination over the next few weeks. Jesus is one of the greatest moral teachers the world has ever known, in part because he refuses to conceive of a God who is tribal, who blesses his friends and destroys his enemies. A universal God calls for a universal people. And when Jesus has his way, all the tribes of the world will bless one another with hospitality. And if God will eventually do that, shouldn't we start doing that today? Amen. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and remain with you always. Amen.